Hello, welcome to Getting Open with me, your host, Andrea Miller. Oof, I have yet another amazing show for you today. My guest and I, we covered a lot of territory, but what really resonates with me right out of the gate is learning to not just love yourself, but practical ways to like yourself as just the foundation, as parents, as friends, as, as all the roles that we play in our lives. But we covered so much more, including what it's like to be a parent in today's age and how stressful and intense it is and ways that we can whew, put down our load a little bit, make things a little more gentle and not necessarily easier, but just a little more manageable. Um, we even talked about aging as a woman and, gosh, some really refreshing, helpful insights from my guests that I'm so happy and excited to share with you and so much more. So let me introduce Dr. Suzanne Gilberg Lenz. Welcome, Suzanne Gilberg Lenz, MD. She is a board certified gynecologist, menopause, and sexual health specialist who practices in Beverly Hills, California, and is board certified in integrative medicine. Dr. Gilbert Glenz frequently appears as an expert in women's health and integrative medicine in the media. Her popular menopause boot camp events led to an amazing book called Menopause Boot Camp Optimize Your Health, Empower Yourself, and Flourish as You Age. Yay, because I'm 53 and I need it. And Dr. Gilbert Glenz is co founder of Cedar Sinai Medical Center's Green Committee and is deeply committed to the promotion of healing. That involves individuals, families, communities, and the planet. There is so much more, but I just tried to get the the tip of the iceberg. So welcome, uh, welcome, Suzanne. It's so nice to have oh, you. Oh, nice on to have getting yes, open. Nice to be had. Nice to be here. <laughs> okay, you are a superwoman, and literally on your site, you say you're on a mission. And I always think when you're on a mission, you're trying to affect change. What is the number one thing you are trying to get people to do differently? Oh, you know, I think the the main thing here is I just really want people to like and love themselves. It's not very complicated because when we when we do center that, we're more capable of having an authentic experience with ourselves and others. And and that I think leads us to get resources, to feel that we deserve those resources, to locate agency, to uh, advocate for ourselves and others, to serve, to be present, joy, all those things will follow. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that was not the answer I expected, but I love it. <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, I want everybody, every person going through menopause. Oh, but I, it's I'm not just you. for people it's going like... through menopause, it's all people. People going yeah, through menopause no. do need to, to re rejigger, like, reconfigure their thought process you know there's a lot of uh programming that goes into sort of a narrative about what it means to age specifically as a woman in this culture and you know in the end we all get to have whatever feelings we have about that but in the end if we accept that narrative then we're part of the problem for ourselves and just you know mere, it's just like actually quite simple so hang on what do you mean if you accept what narrative, the narrative that you you know, aging and as a woman it, you, it becomes you're invisible you're unnecessary you're unimportant you don't count nobody cares i mean you're not hot you can't what, be sexy all of it, anymore whatever right? it is whatever Most it is that you heard because I, also i mean just let's unpack that being hot like why is being hot important i mean maybe that is important to you if your sexuality is important to you but being hot is really still about the male gaze i mean that that's a yeah, it's objectification. So I, I, I have, I'm like, I'm a sexual health expert, and I think sex is incredibly important. It's important in my life, but, but do you hear the difference, right? Like, so, so, um, that narrative's out there, and it is really, really harmful, and it, and it's baked into all sorts of systems. So it is, it's true that it is harming all people because that harms men too. That narrative harms men. It removes wisdom and experience and love and all sorts of things from their lives when when we get pushed aside but you know us accepting that narrative is the first piece of it like if we are like yeah that's true i'm i'm invisible i'm an, then that's part of the problem it's not the only problem when you say okay your number one thing is to like and love yourself and amen like we're soul sisters like totally um at the same time, 
how you do that. I mean, I've been on a many decade journey and I got to say, I've crossed a river. Like life is, is mostly pretty good for me, but it wasn't always. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. You know, it's a process. And I, so I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah. So is there something that you've got? I, I want to talk about Ayurveda. I just love it as a very accomplished Western doctor that you've embraced. Um, in air quotes, alternative therapies. Um, what what do you advocate for, you know, the, the patients that you see and the people you're trying to help when it comes to liking and loving yourself? Is there a thing or two that has helped you most? Wow, that's a great question that I have never really thought about. I mean, that's also a lifelong process and it isn't every day. I don't, I don't, I don't have like pop out of bed like I am awesome every day. I mean, that's absurd, <laughs> you know, but I think doing being in integrity, doing things that align with your inner voice, like we don't all have the same mission on the planet. That really helps because for me, for me, being aligned with a mission and caring about what I do make if I have there's a lot of benefits for me. I mean, me helping other people helps me. I feel good about myself. That's that's my thing. So I think kind of um, quieting things down and connecting with what what is exciting and interesting to you. Um, you know, I think not I'm not always doing so many things. I think adding for me to ask you to add more things to your to do list, I don't think is very helpful. I think we probably need to be doing a whole hell of a lot less because how do we even know who we are or what we want or what we like? If we don't just quiet down and do nothing and listen to our inner voice. I know this sounds like kind of airy fairy, but it's actually like real, it's hard, it's hard work. It's hard work to do that, to put the other things aside that distract us. Um, and look, we have responsibilities, we have bills to pay, we have families to take care of a lot of us, we have a job, you know. I'm not saying like you should just, everybody should, you know, quit life and move to the mountain. Um, I mean, if, you, if that works for you, then that's awesome. But, you know, I, I think, we get very, very busy with being busy. And I just, I mean, there's a lot of, just intuitively, I think people know it's not very good for us. And there's also, you know, lots of, um, lots of research on, on like, for instance, just the, our senses being overloaded. And this, this is actually quite Ayurvedic. Um, when our senses are overloaded with information that is nonsense, that is not high quality, and that is, social media that is what we eat that is who we surround ourselves relationships i mean what we are consuming is not just food right but when we're we're surrounding ourselves with a lot of sense energy and this is real it is it is overwhelming to the nervous system uh it activates us we're in fight or flight our cortisol is up and it's bad for us right inflammation you know also all the things so this isn't just like something that you know i made up or you know and I do want to unpack uh, alter quote alternative medicine in a moment as well. Um, so I think um, it's like complicated and it's simple, honestly. So mm -hmm. it's a paradox, yeah, right? I yeah, mean, in a way, just yeah. even going back to what you were saying, that it is um, maybe uh, obvious in a lot of ways, especially like I just started, I've been talking a lot about this really wonderful meditation practice. I'm all about the guided meditations and I've been on many rants, but I'm, and so it won't be a rant. It'll just be a statement. So many people I've met and heard from have said, I can't yes, meditate. Yes, me too, me too. And I want to say, you got to find the right guided yeah, meditation exactly. or, yeah. or the right, to your point, of finding that quiet inner space. Because to me, there's been so much, especially on TikTok and so forth, about um, like reclaiming our nervous systems. And that to me really feels like, I mean, I, I think there's so much attention for it because it is so necessary and only I can do that for myself, especially with all the noise. I'm like you, I'm a, I'm a working mom. I got a lot of cooking, you know, high, I'm a high bandwidth person, but I'll find myself self overwhelmed too, feeding into the narrative of we got to do more, more, more. Oh my God. All those other moms are like making the cutest cookies and bringing them. My kids are still in elementary and high school. So like that, like, Oh man, it's like it, you you can, and many of us do drive ourselves crazy. So I love your point about only. I mean, you didn't say it exactly, but like this idea, like we individually, it's like to to really get back to liking and loving ourselves. With I think without finding that quiet space regularly, that's a tough call. I mean, I think it it's is. really tough to it do. It is. So let me give you one. I'm going to give you one practice that people can do that is 
based on it's Ayurveda, a, a, a sort of a, um, a version of an Ayurvedic practice. So uh, a lot of people have probably been exposed to the spaification of Ayurveda. So let me just stop and say Ayurveda means the science of life, and it is the ancient um, medical paradigm of India. So I do want to stop for a moment and say this, and I don't, it's not a personal statement against you. It's like the way we think about it in the, in the U.S. and in the West, that that's alternative, which is really, really arrogant and white supremacist and colonial. Because where do you think medicine came from? I mean, Western medicine is an evolution of other medicines that came before us. So furthermore, there's plenty of science to support a lot of the, the practices in those medicines. Uh, so Indian medicine, I read is a lot like Chinese medicine in many ways. They have parallels. They were grew up probably around the same time, four to 6,000 years ago. Um, plants, herbal medicine, obviously figure largely in all these paradigms because that was the available medicine. And again, when when my colleagues or others uh, go online or speak or whatever, write about this as snake oil or woo, whether or not they realize it, they are they are propagating a very colonial racist view because, in fact, I just am going to say it like there's not there's I don't, challenge fight me on it. I, I'm in that mood today. No, I love it. Not I've never not heard you. a phrase like that, and I love it. Not I you. honestly do. Andrea, I don't mean you. I'm, I'm just like I'm no, a little no, bit no, of a no, mood. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm going to be extra spicy today. But here's the I other like thing. It. I'm all for it. A lot of people don't realize that probably about 30% of our pharmaceuticals do come from the plant world directly. It's not. So, so again, I really, it's so important for us. And this is this unification and this capacity for us to reunify with the roots of who we really are is another, to me, practice of self-love and self-care. So Abhyanga, oil massage or self-Abhyanga, self-oil massage is an amazing simple easy thing that somebody can do tonight or tomorrow when they listen to this and that and there's a very traditional way to do this and we're not going to do that but you take let's say 60 to 90 seconds at the end of a shower take a really nice organic oil get cooking oil that's organic is great like you don't have to go be fancy about it if you can put some organic essential oil drops in it to make it smell good rose is really nice for calming for instance um uh whatever you could choose whatever you like and you're going to take it, and there's a very specific pattern in which you apply it to your body. So at the end of the shower, you actually move in long strokes on the long parts of your body. So let's say like on your fingers, long strokes at the joints, round strokes around the joints. And you work actually from out to in. So fingers to palms to wrists, uh, arms, you know, elbow all the way up, both sides of the body, including the, bot the you know, your breasts, your butt, everything. Re you're supposed to get the bottom of your feet, but be careful so you don't slip. Um, and that is, first of all, very nourishing. You're going to get nice oil on your body and it's very, uh, it's great for your skin. But the act of that is stimulating and it's also, you know, touch releases oxytocin, the hormone of love. So this is something that you can do to calm yourself to start your day, to end your day. And it, if there's something about doing that thing for you that reconnects you to you, yeah, and you just touched your heart. It, it does that. And, and I, there's, there's science to support all this stuff too. So that's an easy thing that somebody could do today that will cost you very little money and very little time. No, and I'd love, I love for people that. to okay, do it so and the, report back to you and tell you, you know, ask, do it for 21 days and how, what, what did it do for you? Yeah. Let, let us know, get, get back to me on yeah. uh, getting, uh, getting open and let, you know, let's add to those other practices, but you're saying, so let, we start with the extremities yeah. and we, we do the long yeah. kind of long strokes. Right. And then you sit around the joints. You kind of kind like, of it's circular. hard because I don't know, is this going to be on yeah. YouTube? So you can see it like yeah. around yeah, your yeah, wrists yeah. like this, okay. around yeah, your yeah. elbows like that. And then you're going to do the same thing with your toes, your feet, your ankles. You know, it's it's really, it feels really good too, um, you know, around the sacrum, everywhere, you know. So um, when you're on your belly, you're supposed to do it in the same direction that your gut goes. So, I mean, as a surgeon, I understand how that works. But basically, you're working, your, your colon starts... Um, it's going to go from the bottom right corner up across the top and down the left side. So that's just, I don't know if that's counterclockwise or clockwise. That's too, that's too much math for Bo me. Up, bottom right, up across the left. I think we can figure yeah, that out. Because I don't that's the, the right, direction that your right gut flows. Butt cheek. Right. There, exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got to tell you, my, my, um, my husband's from India. I lived in India for a few years 
And so what I'm thinking about is my dear, I'm going to get a little misty, my, my mother-in-law, I'm doing, I didn't know that there was a name for it, but with both of our boys, she would do that abiango every day yes. when they were babies, yes. like the oil bath. Yes. We had these beautiful pictures of them. We lived in New York at the time. Um, so there wasn't room to sit in the bathroom. <laughs> it was like the tiniest bathroom. So she'd sit, she'd have them sitting in the sun as infants and even toddlers with, you know, she'd do the, you know, sort of water bath and then she would do the, the oil. And that's it was amazing. Just, oh, that's just so a beautiful. really sweet, like connecting mm-hmm. dots. But then to your point about, um, oh, mommy G, will you give it to me? <laughs> She's like, no, <laughs> it's okay. I got to do it to myself. Um, it really like, but to your point. That sometimes, oftentimes, just being very intentional about the small that that can really punch above their weight. Things that we do, but I think of it, the reason I think it punches above their weight is the intentionality. Like, I'm here to care for myself, and I'm going to prioritize that. Even if it's in this way that's seemingly small, it feels like the, like that intentionality is what over, you know, just it sort of, gives it that that overabundance of value even if it's 90 seconds right even like I mean so I I I love that a lot and I feel like when I think about um why integrated medicine and let's call you know and I like I said air quotes alternative no I know um, I know I just I I felt like let me because I think a lot of people no, I, but I agree hear this these idea terms that, like, and they don't and it's confusing especially when you're talking to various medical quote medical experts and I'm quoting that too and this one's saying this, and this one's saying that, and this one's anti this, and, th- and there's a lot of um, a lot of binary thinking, a lot of uh, controversy and fighting and drama, you know, which is really not serving anybody's uh, interests. And I just wanted to point out, like that that finger pointing isn't really respectful, or I uh, yeah, eye rolling and so forth. But let me ask you, because in so many ways. To your point, and even now, thankfully, functional medicine seems to be much more on the rise, right? And that it feels like while that's not, you know, it's it. There's it, issues it there too. Like it, I have things to say about that too. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm what I'm curious about is why do you feel like for someone like yourself that's so accomplished that has embraced integrated medicine, why don't you like you're rare? I feel like you're very rare. I mean, I don't feel like many other MDs are have that that openness um that you do and i'm wondering why that is because it feels in so many ways if you took the you know you took the hippocratic oath don't do no wrong but let's face it you go into medical school most people i think because they really want to care for oh people. absolutely and, and when yes. you think about these methodologies being thousands of years old being able to care you know die like i mean let's even face it with certainly with ayurveda i mean you think about the benefit of of diet what you should eat what you shouldn't eat i mean so like they say I, i'm not a doctor obviously but I, i've heard like you barely go over nutrition when you're in medical school and even now so many doctors it's like geez cancer um flourishes with sugar but as i understand it very few oncologists are saying hey cut out sugar right so so you here, know here's the thing all of this is all of this is true and medical school is four years long It's always been four years long. And I want you to think about the amount of technological advancements that we've seen just in the general public in the last 20 years, okay, Um, 30 years since I graduated. And we are still trying to fit everything into four years. So we have to give uh, my colleagues a lot of grace. They are literally doing the best they can. They may not have come from a very open or curious perspective. Um, It's not in their wheelhouse. It's there's only so much time in the day residency after medical school is grueling and for someone like you know OBGYN like we're learning how to do everything from pelvic surgery to deal with cancer to office management to sexually transmitted infections to contraception to pregnancy care to birth which is extremely complicated the high risk birth okay so you know that's why menopause has gotten left out partly and that's why nutrition and, and all the integrative medicine oh my god So we got to like we have to stop expecting. And then you look at what's going on in the medical system. Our doctors are really getting abused by this extremely toxic system, insurance organizations that they're working for. They're now employees. They don't have a lot of um, time. They have to do volume. So people really have to understand like the reality uh, in which their doctors 
uh, were trained and are working, and they're really trying to do what they can in a system that doesn't honor a lot of that human connection. It's very, very unfortunate. And honestly, Andrea, we are heading into a, a, a more of a crisis, I think. So what's happening with like integrative and functional medicine, I mean, those are basically cash practices because you can't sit. So it's for the elite. It's for people who can afford it. And, and I will say that I think that a lot of those people are so interesting and motivated by what's cutting edge and new and trying to make those connections and trying to spend time. But then also I see some, you know, monkey business go on there too, because they'll take, you know, quote science and it's a very small sample. So how is that really applicable? Or it's um, what we call bench research. It's like lab research and, but it's not really been proven to be clinically effective. So, you know, I'm gonna look, again, people are doing what they believe is the best. I really do think the best of most of my colleagues and patients have to be discerning. They just have to be discerning. Is it working for them? Is it something that they see, think is valuable? Do they feel that there's a respect and an integrity and a partnership there? Because the other thing that I think that really happens in medicine that's healing, there's medicine and there's healing. And, you know, I think Ayurveda talks a lot about healing. They do talk about medicine. You know, there are texts that have surgical procedures in there because even 3000 years ago, they realized like, you know, it would have been great to nip this in the bud with lifestyle, but now it's too late. We got to cut this thing off. I mean, they're very, it's like so practical, which I love. I love, you know, there's like, there's like the rishis, the sages came down and they had this vision about this and that, but you know what, this nose thing is infected and you got to cut it off and this is how you do it. And it's, there's actually like plastic surgery. Uh, there, it's really wild. So yeah, 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 yeah. So I think we have to, we have to sort of look at the big picture and what people are, are capable of. We have to meet them where they are. And, um, and that comes from both sides, you know, it's a partnership, but I was saying healing, the healing often isn't the prescription. It's the listening. It's the, it's the encouragement. It's the support. It's the validation. It's the healing touch. It's the healing word. I don't think we can, um, ignore that. And that's something that we're never really going to be able to quantify. Yeah. How much is that encouraged in medical school? Um, it's not always talked about explicitly, but of course, um, it's it, explicitly in terms of like things like cultural competency and really like understanding where patients are coming from, um, paying attention to, um, environment, including, uh, you know, the community bedside manner, you know, just basic like active listening that that is encouraged and I mean look I went to medical school a long time ago but even when I trained our first you know the first two years of medical school are classroom learning essentially but um my medical school and I think a lot of medical schools do this and did this had us with a mentor attending physician from the community once a week on the wards in the hospital learning how to do those things learning how to establish bedside manner learning how to establish rapport learning how to like read the chart and start synthesizing this information and communicating it with the patient. I mean, it's taken very seriously. I think doctors are really have been gotten a bad rap. Like, and I'm, I, I thank you for starting the way you did, which is that people don't go into medicine because they don't care. I mean, it is extremely hard to get into medical school and to stay in medical school. It is so much harder than you could imagine. So, oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I'm amazed when I talk to my doctor and it's like there's something so random, like I'll have a bump or whatever. And they're like, oh, that's a blah, like a Latin word with like more letters than a German word. And you're like, how do you even know that? You know what I mean? Cause like so much has been packed in. Well, what you're reminding me of is Atul Gawande, the you know surgeon and doctor in New York, um, the New Yorker writer who's written all these bestselling books as well. He gave a beautiful commencement address. My dear niece graduated from Johns Hopkins on um, their their public health school. And um he, you know, he kind of did this this run up in terms of just, you know, all, all like how much, um, uh, you know, medicine is evolving. And, and to your point, and then you've got like um, social media. And he's like, my daughter is asking me about like, no joke, like, like snail trails or something. He's like, well, I don't even know about that. But it was this ancient wisdom. You know, so he's talking about like how there's so much like being thrown at at you know, across the medical spectrum from, you know, the public health uh, participants and workers to the doctors and, you know, nurses and caregivers themselves. The, you know, he was like, the thing that, w that we, you know, we're really called to do is care. 
And it was just this like beautiful moment of like that caring can't get right, you know, and AI's, you know, doing more and so forth. But to your point that like beautiful, just only humans can care. I mean, and yes, some, there could be some mental health app or whatever that can, you know, like kind of do a little bit, but it just, to your point, I just, that feeling of like, Ooh, there is nothing like a human sincerely caring. Right. And whether it's a doctor or a mom or a, you know, a, a sister or coworker. So let me ask you about, about this kind, kind of in the alternative space, I guess. Uh, rumor has it that you're supportive of microdosing. True or not oh. true? <laughs> I am. I am. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I've seen it be very, very effective. Um, of course, I have nothing to do with it other than to listen. <laughs> I have no idea how, why, or where anybody's doing that, but I've heard they're doing it. And I think, I think, um, I think psychedelics in general, but I'm most interested in mushrooms and psilocybin. And you, and I think now that we've been talking, that makes sense, right? Cause I'm like very much, I just really love the natural world and I really love how we interact with the natural world. And there's something about, I mean, consuming a, one part of the natural world, consuming another part of the natural world and it having an effect just seems like the right thing to do. That doesn't mean I think everybody should stop by the side of the road and like just try some things like that. Don't do that. Do not no, do I, that. No, I should have added <laughs> the, 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 you know, yeah, therapeutic right, 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 right. The but, and but psilocybin is interesting to me. And the thing is we do have um, a fair number of studies and a lot of them are actually older studies from, you know, the early days, like from the 70s and stuff and 60s, um, looking at, you know, neuroplasticity impacts on brain connections, on um, creating more... Um, neuronal connections. It's very, very promising. There's just not enough data on it, but I have definitely observed um, at, from anecdotal reports, people really having major impacts on their mental health specifically. And I think there's a, and I've had uh, people that I know, uh, patients that have really had an impact on premenstrual uh, mood disorders, on PMS related mood disorders, it's really, really interesting. I mean, obviously, there's quite a bit of data on it for addiction, uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety in general in the psychedelic world. There's very solid data on this. So I think the opportunity there is huge if we could get, you know, the government to help us uh, work with it, you know, do it legally. There's, I actually advise for a company that is involved in research that is uh, DEA approved. There are only two labs in the United States that are DEA approved to do this specific kind of research. So we are at, um, the company is called Interstate, and we are currently doing research at Ohio State University. Um, and they're just starting with, you know, just get it, pulling the components out, what's there. And I really like it because they're doing whole mushroom research. They're not just trying to pull the psilocybin out and make it into a drug. And I, and I think that's really important for people who are interested in this kind of stuff. There's something that we call the entourage effect. And that's that, you know, in a, any kind of herb plant, well, I'm going to explain it. Um, in any kind of herb plant, the mushroom, whatever, it's not just the one active ingredient that maybe we can pull out chemically. And that's how, by the way, we evolved from plant-based medicine in Ayurveda, let's say, to pharmaceuticals, right? So willow bark to aspirin. Aspirin is made from willow bark. Um but we pull the one ingredient, we amplify it, and we make it a very powerful drug. And that's amazing. And that's incredible. That's how we have antibiotics. That's how people don't die from a stub toe anymore. Okay. You know, chemotherapy, this is amazing stuff. But I think there's something to be said for understanding how all of these components that work together in the natural world and that nature for some reason put together, how do they work together um, forever? Like I, I'm, I'm really more interested in learning about the whole mushroom and not just pulling the psilocybin out, if that makes sense. Because I think it's different. I don't think it's the same thing. I mean, it. I feel like I, I could talk to you for days. I my, One of my favorite places that I'd go to, I'd torture my family and make them go with me to the New York Botanical Garden. And we'd go into this gigantic greenhouse. And it just, it, it's like, you know, it just, it, it shared so much about the plants that have yet to be discovered. And to your point, how much that has been discovered by intrepid, you know, I'm assuming um, researchers and discoverers. And to your point too, that over thousands, you know, somehow passed, I'm sure a bunch has been lost, but then those that have been passed forward for thousands of years, 
that have given us what we have now. I mean, I didn't realize that Willow, Bar- Willow Bark was the basis of yeah. aspirin. So good little little fact. Yeah. Right? I'll I'll throw that to my kid today. <laughs> um, but it, it does it does give you a profound appreciation for what Mother Nature has given us. And you know, and I just when I think about the opportunity for there to be so much more of that cultivation, um, it it actually feels heartening to me, right? Because you think like without the side effects. Or, or you know, with more maybe more minimum side effects. I realize that some I don't of the know. natural I things can have side effects too. I, exactly, they can. I just think that there's something intriguing to me about why were these things put together, and what will they do together that's different than when they pulled them apart. This is different. It's a different way to look at it. I feel like something's lost. I feel like something could be lost. But yeah, we're in the infancy of learning about this stuff, and it's super interesting. It's very, very fascinating. It is super interesting, super fascinating. And one, I'm not a cynic. I'm a, actually, as an entrepreneur, very much of a capitalist, but I can't help but ugh, just feel like there are there are sort of toxic capitalistic interests, interests that are preventing um, these kind of ancient practices, the plant medicines and so forth, from um, being widely adopted. You know, because it's like, yeah, there is you know, they so much opportunity. Yeah, I mean, if they can't monetize it, then they're not interested and they're not going to support it. And um, I mean, that or they'll block it. I mean, I, you know, they, the FDA blocked, and I don't know the details. I don't want to purport to be an expert, even kind of, because I'm not. Um, but MDMA um, was up for uh, some kind of approval for, I want to say, therapeutic I th- use. I think it was for know, PTSD kind of, treatment. I think. Yeah. And that and it was supposed to happen this summer and earlier, maybe in the spring, it was like, yeah, nah. And I don't know the details, but one can't help but wonder if there are lobbying interests saying, whoa, if that's the breakthrough. I mean, I don't know the dollars that um, are made on different um, uh, antidepressants, but considering like a quarter to a third of people or some huge number of people are on antidepressants, that really threatens the corporate bottom line. Right. I don't think you have to be a cynic to go, well, I could see how those interests could be misaligned. But that's also, you know, we know there is data showing that as uh, menopausal hormone therapy prescriptions go down. And just so you know, in this country, I think we're under 10 percent of women who could be eligible for hormone replacement therapy are taking it. 10 percent. Okay, I want to ask you about that. So it's been I mean, and actually, I was thinking about it when I was preparing for a discussion. It reminds me a lot of antidepressants. Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you, look, look, as HRT goes down, Uh antidepressant use goes up. And something like one in four women over, let's say, 40 or 45 are on antidepressants at some point. So you go and you try to unpack that. But only 10 percent of us are on hormone therapy. That's crazy. And. Every woman over a certain age is, who's alive is going to experience the menopausal transition and then be postmenopausal for the rest of her life. So the average age of menopause is like 51, 52, and um, the average life expectancy right now is about 80. Okay, so you do that math. So if you look at seven to 10 years leading up to that menopause, the perimenopause or the transitional time, that's like ha- basically half your life, half your life. Half your life, only 10% of us are on hormone therapy. And it's a little hard to track because that's FDA approved prescriptions, but there's not that many people who are on like compounded hormones that are not being tracked. That's insane. Well, so I'm not a doctor and I, but I, as somebody who's now right in that sweet spot and I'm, you know, having friends that are having experiences so forth. One of my friends, it's, you know, the hormone replacement therapy literally saved her. I mean, oh, good Lord, my friend was just having such a tough time. But, and so I compare the two with antidepressants because on the one hand, antidepressants have been a godsend to some. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and same with um, hormone replacement therapy. And yet there's been this serious amount of of, of vilification. So why has there been the vilification? And as as one of the leading experts, what what, what is your advice? And I realize everybody has to make their own decisions. And this is not a medical show. You are not anybody's doctor listening to the show. But what, what, how, why should people sort of rethink if people are like, no, no hormone replacement therapy, that's bad. Right. Why, why are well, they wrong? They think maybe? that they think that because, um, in 2002, there was a very, very large study, the largest study of its time at the time or since then, that was, uh, the NIH funded billion dollars to study the impact, uh, on long-term health of women 
uh, undergoing menopause and using hormone replacement therapy. And at that time, in the late 90s, hormone replacement therapy was one of the most prescribed medications in North America. It was a specific type and brand. It was a little different than what we're using now, but um, it was like the thing to do because there was a lot of data showing that it had positive impacts on many aspects of life, not the least of which was quality of life. But the problem with the study was that it was looking at women, and I just told you the average age of menopause is 51-ish. The average age of the woman in that study was 62. There were just a lot of problems. These women were already at risk or already had things like heart disease, and they, and the, they had some preliminary data that was quite concerning. They released it directly uh, publicly. Actually, some of the principal investigators, some of the people responsible were left out of it. There was a lot of weird politics that went straight to Gina Colada at the New York Times, who, by the way, still is doubling down on this 22 years later. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it was wrong. She's an amazing, what is, she's like a seasoned, incredible reporter. So the thing is, we immediately, the medical community was like, this doesn't seem right. People started, you know, rejiggering the data, rehashing it, relooking at it. And almost immediately, most of the medical community who really understood this work was like, this isn't really correct. This isn't really widely applicable. applicable. This isn't right. And they have, there's a lot of really, really, um, really amazing data because it's a large data set that has come out of it. That's very, very interesting and important. But the takeaway was incorrect, but it wasn't incorrect that people heard that because that's the message that was directed at the media. And they suddenly halted the study and that was that. And it was all about breast cancer risk and heart disease risk, basically strokes um, and heart attacks. And it just, it's not correct. And so we've had 22 years of women being scared of being on hormones, basically. But what's happened is that finally the voices of reason are prevailing. A lot of researchers have been out publishing, re-looking at things, looking at newer, more modern forms. Um, we've had a very hard time getting we. I mean, I'm not poorly a part of that, but you know, the, the medical community, I'm saying the we, we're all we. Um, and then the really the watershed moment, I think, for the public was that the New York Times published an article in early 2023, an incredible article by Susan Dominus called Women Have Been Misled About Menopause. And it was basically told the story. So if people are interested or concerned or like, I don't know, my doctor said, just read this article. It's going to make you mad because you'll understand why, what happened and what went down. And I'm not here to say that everybody should be on hormone therapy. But I'm here to say that everybody should be offered the information. It's not informed consent if you don't have all the information. There are a small number of people who really, it's not safe for them to use hormone replacement therapy, but it's a much smaller number of people than you would expect. And I think that we're going to see, as people start becoming more aware and demanding hormone therapy um, and demanding that their doctors are trained in menopause care and in midlife and older women's health, I think we're going to see changes. But it's going to take a long time because we have now several generations of women who did not benefit from this. And it's really tragic in my in my it view. Almost seems like given given what and I don't, I don't know the intricacies, but, you know, that that billion dollar NIH study that was released in 2002, it almost feels like what that needs, a, you know, like that needs to be re, you know, like, let's do it again with people like. 20 years younger, you said many of them were well past yeah, menopause, 10 years past still menopause. in menopause, you know? Yeah, well yeah, past so menopause. Yeah. yeah, yeah. it seems like, well, that, I'm going to, okay, so this is my weird seg, uh, segue. Um, U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, let's, you know, let's get, let's get those, you know, now we'll probably need $2 billion to do something equivalent. Let's get an HR, a new HRT study launched under your leadership. And I, I bring him up as you and I were chatting right before um, the show started. Um, he, the Surgeon General, issued an advisory recently talking about the the overwhelm of on so many parents. And he used the stat, I think it was 48 percent of parents are feeling extremely overwhelmed. And he goes on and, and references a lot of data that I'm like, as a working mom, I'm like, duh, the tracks. I didn't need Wait, to no, read so the when, data. When we were talking about it, what I said to you is that parenting is bad for your health. <laughs> parenting is bad it's for not funny it's funny not funny yeah. i mean i'm a parent no too. it's not funny it's freaking crazy and it's especially hard on women it is it is especially hard on women because often in you know heterosexual households women are just you know shouldering a much greater burden there's so much data on that 
And it's just, but here's the thing. Like, of course, any person who's a parent is like, like you said, like, duh. But, but you know, the thing is policy, policy changes occur when science indicates a change needs to happen. So it seems sometimes it's annoying and frustrating because I get I get like this too. I'm like, do we really have to prove this sci- this common sense, you know? But we <laughs> yeah, do exactly. because if Just we want the come, NIH come to, to find it, meeting. you know, yeah or, yeah, or if we want Congress to pass a bill, and of course, you know, looking at child care, you know, or child tax credits, or totally, you know, yeah, universal pre K and all those things, you yes. know, all these things. Or how about like lining up work schedules and school schedules, like. This makes no sense. Like, how are you supposed to get to work and get your kid? I mean, it's I I did all that for years, too. Um, and I had, you know, a, I mean, my my now ex-husband was a super involved parent and was you know, stayed home for a long time. And it was so, so, so hard. Like, I just it's not it's crazy. It's so crazy. And I work, you know, I was a resident during both of my pregnancies. I didn't get I, got I remember reading about that in your off. book. Six what weeks went of maternity through. leave. Yeah. I think somebody, so one of the doctors um, indicated that there was a position waiting for you. And it was just like, yeah, you know, you, you, my program take director it threatened throat. me. She yeah. threatened oh, me. Oh, maybe it was, I don't know. You're no, right. No, threatened no, no. versus she called offered. Me. No, no, no. This is what she did. She called, she sent me a teddy bear, <laughs> which was nice. Okay, whatever. And then called me to check on me, but really to say, just so you know, you know, your leave is six weeks and you're, we, we will not hold your spot for you if you do not come back in six weeks. That was an OBGYN residency. And this one was a mother too, by the way. Yeah. Well, and what which by the way, I found out like... later was illegal to do. Oh, well, and it's so common. I mean, that's it. You know, I feel like that. So when I think about, um, uh, this surgeon general advisor, I'm, I'm obviously a business leader. I mean, I just think about, in a lot of ways, it's a duh, but you hope because there's so much coverage on it. We're talking about it. It's all over social media and so forth. Somehow that it bubbles up, you know, and he's got some great policies that he's recommending that are so necessary and so overdue. But I also think back, you mentioned just, you know, this whole business of being able to work remotely. I mean, we were my company, your tango, we're entirely remote and it has some disadvantages. I want to hug and high five my team every day. I can't. Um, but, you know, there is that advantage of, oh, my kid is sick. I'm just going to pop over to the junior high and pick them up right. or whatever. And it's just, it, it feels like for more um, business leaders to say, hey, it is good for us as a company to ensure that our, our, our parents can take, you know, can do what they need as parents. And, you know, and then you get, then you get like, wah, wah, wah. Oh, I'm not a parent. Why am I, I should get other privileges. Like there's a part of me that's like, oh, good Lord, can we just do the right thing? as as you know corporate leaders um and then i feel like you add even the sandwich generation right so many of us are you know had kids late and i'm guessing in la you probably see a lot of that so rather than our parents being able to help us raise our kids it's oh man i'm raising my kids and now i also have that extra um you know responsibility yeah, it's really and, and intense concern. and maybe you're not even in the same community physically it's very very stressful and then the other thing that i'm starting to really think about is um this the you know the phenomenon of women getting pregnant and starting families much older than than any other previous uh time in history and then they're they enter early parenthood really in early perimenopause and they do not realize it and they don't know what hit them so i was 31 and 34 when I had my children, which seemed old at the time. But when I look at my patients now, really wasn't that old. And I was exhausted. I mean, I was a, I don't, I was a resident. I was exhausted. Right. But I was like pretty young. And I, you know, I mean, when I have patients that have a kid at 40 or 42, that you come, your, your toddler years, your infancy years with them, you are in perimenopause. So sure you're exhausted because you're a new mom and, 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 and parenting is, incredibly physically and mentally exhausting. I mean, it's beautiful. It's an amazing experience. I'm the best thing I ever did, honestly. I mean, that I'm I'm that kind of person. I do feel that way. But it's amazingly challenging. And to do that and now your hormones are changing, you don't feel the same and you don't even realize it. And I think we're just barely starting to talk about that right now. I saw and I want to acknowledge this midwife who was talking about this online and I don't know who she was, but I was it stopped me in my tracks. And I've been really thinking a lot about it in the last month or so, like, oh my God. Yes. Yes. This is something we need to explore and honor. 
Because I think when people are getting pregnant at 38, I'm not saying like, hey, don't do it. I'm just saying like, just know you're going to have a two-year-old and you're going to probably be in perimenopause and it's going to be, we're going to, this is how we're going to handle it. This is how we're going to help you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a different kettle of fish for sure. I mean, in some ways, I honestly, as an older parent, I feel like I'm wiser and I, I'm a relatively high, you know, high energy person, but, but yes, I mean, my husband's even 10 years older than me. So it, you know, he's not necessarily the dad that is playing tackle football or, you know, out there running around playing soccer you know, with the kids in the yard, because it's just, it's just kind of too much. I mean, he does a ton of other things for, for them. Um, But so let's, so we need to wrap up in just a few minutes. I feel like it's just a really beautiful way to come full circle, (coughs) excuse me, Um, where when we started, you said the number one thing you care about is to like and love yourself. And you reference where it's like, slow down a little, like do less. And so I would just, I mean, some people, I mean, and I'm, I always say I'm a type AAA Aries. I'm like, what can I do? Like, I don't want to do less. And then when I give myself that permission to say, you know what, I'm just going to get the Costco cookies because I don't have time to bake them and I'm not going to guilt trip myself. I'm going to do something. And then, or, or sometimes I'm not, I actually used to be much more like last year, I kind of checked out with doing my volunteer stuff at the school. I'll, I'll try to do better this year, but I, I had to give my, and I, I emphasize this because it is so personal. I had to give my per- self, myself permission to be okay with letting the other parents pull their pull a little extra weight. I didn't have it in me. And I just was like, you know what, Andrea, you can beat yourself up and feel badly about it. Or or you can just say, you know what, this is just where I am right now. And and so I just I guess I'd be curious about your, you know, either your your advice and parents giving themselves permission to do a little less. Because ultimately, I feel like we have this limited window of time with our kids. And what our kids really need from us, I actually saw a headline the other day. People are going into major debt for Disney vacations. Listen, we've done the whole Disney thing. I'm grateful for I mean, I'm kind of grateful, kind of not. Um, I get it. But it's like kids don't need the Disney vacations. They need like, a, even if it's 15 or 20 minutes, just to chill yep. out with your yep. kids. We'll model that like, behavior for them. A few days a week, right? Yeah. Oh my, yeah. My son and I, we do backgammon every night before bed. It is Amazing. the sweetest tradition. Amazing. <laughs> so it's so sweet. Yeah, no, it's really sweet. But I, but I say that because I mean, so often we as parents, we're trying to check the Disney box. We're trying to check, like, like my kids don't have very cute rooms, and I feel I'm like, oh, all the other kids have cute rooms. I'm like, no, nope, haven't gotten to that. Maybe one day. You know what I mean? Like that's just been the ball that I've allowed to drop. Thankfully, they're boys, so. It's- not not you know it's like they don't have the princess room or whatever but any other advice like or is there things that you've said you know what I'm just not going to do it or even when you were you know when your kids were younger that here's my thing when when people give others permission I always give credit to Ariana Huffington like 15 years ago she talked about in a lecture I was at that she was speaking she's like when I'm when I get stressed I sleep and I'm like oh I can do that (laughs) you know so now I'm like when I get stressed I, I sleep and I'm like, thanks for the permission, Ariana. So any any other thing that you've either taken off your plate or you've seen others like, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to do it my way. I would just I think my, myself and, and our listeners and viewers would welcome that because so often that social pressure goes both ways or, you know, or not goes both ways, like social pressure versus social permission. Mm-hmm. Make sense? Yeah. I so mean, any, anything in you terms can of parenting, suggest- you know, my kids are in their 20s, so I'm like in a very different phase of parenting. But I will say that I think it's it, it may look a little different, but it's a similar thing. And that is what I just said. Like, you know, the way we treat ourselves is the way we are teaching other people to treat us. And also for our kids, they're watching us. How if you're running around like a chicken with a head cut off, and be a martyr all the time, you're training them that that's what a mom is and that's what they should expect from themselves if they become a parent or in a relationship. So really, you know, saying no, also having boundaries and being honest with your kids. Like mommy is really, I'm so, mommy is tired, listen to me. I mean, this is how I used, I did talk probably when they were little, but just like, you know what? I'm really, and actually listen, I like when I was um, pregnant with my daughter, I was a resident, I had a toddler. I mean, talk about guilt. He's almost 27 and I still feel guilty. But I would come oh, home boy. and he had a... Um, oh, Suzanne, you got to get rid of that. I know. But I... <laughs> That'll be another we show. Have a nice, we have a nice relationship, though. But um, okay. he had a couch in his room and he had and, and a big play space. And I would just come and just like 
lay on the couch and kind of play, but I was with him. I was in his presence. We were together. He could snuggle with me. He could run around and be a maniac because he was that boy. But we were together. But I also was like, I was on call last night, honey. And I know you don't even know what that is, but I'm really tired. So I'm going to just be with you in the way that I can be with you. And I think it's just about having integrity and, and being who you are. You know, like just now, on, to be perfectly honest, my, my 23-year-old, my daughter is on a vacation and having a moment about a boy and texting me. And I was like, babe, I love you so much. I actually have to go right now. Like instead of making myself crazy and being like, I have to answer her. I have to, you know, da, 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 I've got this podcast. It's like, I mean, I'm an adult. I have responsibilities. She's sad. She's with her friend. We'll resume the conversation. Like, and these are the things as a parent, it sounds like stupid, but you know, as a mom, like these are the things that like, ugh, hurt your heart. But when I do that, I'm also showing her like, look, I love her. I also have a life. That's how I put food on the table for y'all for your entire life. That's how you ended up at schools. All those things. Like I yeah. did these things for me, but also it's for modeling. you. Yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. perfect. I'm doing the best I can. I really think, I think saying no, I really think saying no. I, I had a hard time saying no also. I'm a, I'm a doctor for God's sake. I'm like a club, like we're people pleasers. You know, yeah. come on, <laughs> you, you've got to be codependent to go to medical school. I mean, really, whether or oh, not you realize Lord, yeah. it. A little bit of a masochist. Right. So mm-hmm. so it's incumbent upon us to do some work on ourselves and just be honest about that. I don't, you know, I, don't, I wish I had something more, but that's that's what I can say. No, I think those are good. I, I'll just chime in. Um, my family, I used to, I was actually reading to my kids in the womb. I'm, I'm that per, like door. Um, and, and my older son and I, we read every like the the big fat books, every Harry Potter. Book. Oh yeah, no, we, we read, read every night. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And but we got to a point. I mean, just these last couple of years, we've um we've gotten real lazy, and we listen to audio. That's now. amazing. I'm like you know, yeah. And I just again, I, in the spirit of permission, I've been a little guilty, but it's like I would rather lay down and relax in the dark, listening to a really wonderful like the Newbery Book Award books. Like they're just all so beautiful, and like like story after story and they have just a beautiful lesson to to lay back when mommy is really exhausted to get that quality time together cuddling and listening and just relaxing together to me it's been like you know what to to your point like sometimes you got to say no here's a way I can say yes in a way that works for me and that you know just giving myself permission and to your point too about how I treat myself and how I show up in my relationship with my kids is teaching them how to treat themselves and you know when they're dads hopefully they'll be dads I keep telling them I want I want grandbabies <laughs> uh but I just I say that just in the spirit of it is so freaking hard to be a parent today you know working parent it feels like especially but I realize if you're at home maybe you know at least you have a social outlet you know but yeah any kind I of don't parent. know I mean it's I, hard, it's hard. And then there's it's more you're, you're there all the time and you don't have I mean yeah it's you don't get, don't get some Nobody's telling you what a great job you're no, doing. Typically, nobody's no. doing what a great telling you what a great job you're doing. Yeah. As a parent, and so I, I'm glad the Surgeon General's office has has brought this to the surface. Has the data. Everybody's saying, "Duh, you know, parenting is bad for your health." <laughs> I love that. I kind of love it. I kind of don't. Kind of <laughs> it hurts my heart. Well, it's it's bad for our health when we don't do it with support. There's a reason why, and this kind of gets back to another theme of this conversation, which is like. We need each other. We need each other. We need to be in community with one another. Um, and, and you know, the old ways of people being in villages and tribes and, and extended family and chosen family, it works better because it's a hard job and you need wisdom and you need support and you need a break and you need this one's good at this and this one's good at that. And everybody doesn't have the same skill set. And children need a lot of love and attention and wisdom and perspective. And it's to ask one person to be all of those things, it doesn't even make sense. It's not actually the way we were designed. So, you know, community is the medicine also, I always say, you know. So how do we, you know, look, there's also the huge, that huge study in the last two years talking about isolation and loneliness being at, you know, epi- ec- epidemic records and being more dangerous to your health than smoking, and I think we have seen in the last couple of years as we are um, we ha- we're required to isolate from our, each other and ourselves how much we need each other. And we have a lot of healing to do, I think, around that. You know, I think we're still in uh, a lot of post-traumatic 
um, yeah. from that yeah, in I ways think, that uh, yeah, I'm I, really still continuing to unpack for myself. You know? Yeah, I, I think it's a good reminder because I feel like a lot of us are like, okay, COVID is a long time ago. We've moved on. But no. I mean, developmentally for kids no. and, yeah. you know, just and the, adults. The, 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 yeah. 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 And no, I think it's a, it's important for people, you know, whatever they can do with it to, if, if nothing else, to say, okay, here's, here's what's happening. Here's why this is still hard. And I, you know, I'm still needing to heal from it. But I, what did you say? Community is healing. Yeah. Community is medicine. Community is medicine. Just being together. Just being together. And being like, how about if we just could be a little more kind to each other? Like, we don't have to agree with everybody about everything. Who said that? But, but this, this binary that's going on, like you're either for me or against me. And if you don't believe exactly the same way that I do, then you are canceled. I mean, I don't like, yes, there are, there are moral and immoral things. There is truth and there is fact. But can we, reapproach just being around each other because it actually turns out that it is better for us to be around each other so we have to well, relearn that, that a little bit totally and i think back to just at the very beginning this idea of learning to like and love yourself and whether it's the abiyango bath or abiyango massage or you know these other things meditation microdosing um that can enable each of us as individuals to feel that love and self-care to that gives us a little more tolerance absolutely like, I am way more tolerant for dissenting opinions and assholery you know and a lot of times that assholery is just coming from a place of hurt of and course, lack and so to show up, and anger that's what i mean i yeah, think that's why i empathy. led with it because the thing is if we don't yeah. like and love ourselves and like truly and give ourselves grace a lot of the stuff that we've talked about and i think it's interesting i think we have a lot in common and maybe, you know, being parents, being working women, being out in the world, being public in some ways. Like if you, if first of all, you can say like, love yourself, self-esteem, blah, blah, blah. But if it's really not coming from an authentic place, you're, you know it and everybody else around you knows it, but you nailed it. You nailed it, Andrea, because the reality is you can't really respect other people if you don't even like yourself and you can't, you can't tolerate much if you don't, if you can't tolerate yourself, if you are ashamed of yourself in some way and you don't have a way to process that that's safe, it's going to get projected outward. So I think we can do better. I think we can act more like adults. <laughs> this is a just basic adult behavior. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think of even just um, you're willing to go see your, your doctor regularly, your willingness to take care of yourself and get the exercise you need and so forth. You know, modeling that for others, giving, you know, back to the social permission, you know, it, it does feel like ultimately it starts with with each of us. And and you're, you know, the point that you asked uh, or uh, urged a little while ago just to give each other grace. Like, I think that's probably a good uh, I would say unless there's one more point you want to make, certainly giving each other grace. Any uh, last word? I, I feel uh, like that's a great place Suzanne. to end. <laughs> that's a great place to end. And, all right. Well, you're amazing. This has been such a beautiful conversation i really appreciate it oh, thank you thank you for having for me it was on, amazing yeah, yeah being on getting open all right um this is a wrap uh with dr suzanne gilberg lens i want to make sure i get get the whole thing in there um please subscribe follow like love us like and love us we like and love ourselves right like that's the whole point uh thanks so much for tuning in to another great episode we'll see you next time